get started. Um, my name is Liz Marcello. I am a PhD student in the Urban Planning Program here at GSAC, and I'm a member of the committee that organized today's event. Uh, thank you all for joining us for Past is Prologue, 100 Years of Zoning. As many of you know, 2016 marks the 100th anniversary of the New York City Zoning Ordinance, and thus presents an opportunity to <coughs> critically assess the current state of land regulation. Today we begin that assessment by engaging with senior practitioners and scholars to better understand the variety of experiences with zoning in New York City. Today's discussion will hopefully just be the beginning of a longer conversation about zoning, about cities throughout the United States and the world. This event was initiated by PhD students in the Urban Planning Program, along with the help of Professor Elliot Sklar. We are also assembling a larger day-long conference to be held here at the university in December that will take on the themes brought up in today's discussion. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Patrice Darrington is the Holiday Associate Professor here at Columbia and the Director of the Real Estate Development Program. Professor Darrington has examined the real estate sector in New York City from academia at NYU and in the private sector with J.P. Morgan Chase and as CEO of several real estate development companies from the public sector and from the public sector as a member of the Lower Manhattan <coughs> Development Corporation. Michael Gerard is the Andrew Saban Professor of Professional Practice at the Columbia Law School. Dr. Gerard has published extensively on the inter intersection of environmental law and land regulation, including issues of climate change and green energy. Raquel Ramadi is architect and urban designer and the president of Raquel Ramadi Associates. Ms. Ramadi began her career as the director of the Urban Design Group, an influential body of architects and designers under Mayor Lindsay, who worked to reimagine zoning and planning, especially of open space. She has served as a planner and urban designer for dozens of sites across New York City. And Professor Elliot Scar is the director of the Center for Sustainable Urban Development at Columbia's Earth Institute, as well as a professor of urban planning and international affairs here at Columbia. Professor Scar teaches, writes, and advises across a wide spectrum of urban challenges. His, his book, You Don't Always Get What You Pay For, The Economics of Privatization, has garnered many academic prizes. We're also happy to welcome Charles Bagley, journalist at the New York Times, and author of the acclaimed book on land, housing, and finance in New York City, Other People's Money. He will be moderating today's event. And with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Bagley. Hi, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, claimed. Uh, I, I thought I would just make a few, my own little take on 100 years of zoning. And then we could open it up for uh, five minutes, a strict five minutes. I don't want to put you all to sleep. I understand we have some very high <coughs> test coffee. But, but most importantly, to get into some discussion and some debate uh, and questions from the audience. So uh, I, I, 100 years. I, I think we're at a very uh, interesting point, and in a way, a departure from much of the history. Why do I say that? Well, uh, I think that New York has always had a sort of schizophrenic uh, view of, of, of uh, skyscrapers and zoning and all this stuff, right? Uh, I mean, you start with the 1916 zoning law. What, part of what provoked it was the construction of a, a, of a building downtown, the equitable building. And uh, yeah, people were talking about a zoning law before that, but this thing apparently appalled a lot of people. It was all of 38 stories mm -hmm. tall. Uh, you know, this is the city of skyscrapers, right? Well, the first skyscraper was in Chicago. I think it was in New York. So we're always a little nervous. Here's this equitable building going up straight up, 38. Oh my God, it's appalling. Uh, and, and so you have a new law that tries to control the environment, try, uh, you know, what, what's gonna, what this city's gonna look like. And zoning is a very powerful tool. On the one hand, uh, it shapes what our city looks like and, and how we live in it. On the other hand, it also makes, it can make some people very rich. When you rezone a, a piece of manufacturing land for, or, or what's zoned for manufacturing, and suddenly it's zoned for 
residential or, or whatever, uh, all of a sudden the guy, the owner is sitting on a hot property. Um, just ask the people that own the property underneath the uh, High Line uh, and the deal they cut with the Bloomberg administration. That's another story. Um, so, but that didn't finish. The equitable building wasn't the end of it. I remember in uh, the Koch administration, you know, the city's coming back from a terrible uh, fiscal and financial uh, 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 recession. And um, where Travelstead, I'm probably the only one that remembers his name, wants to build the tallest building in the world at 383 Madison Avenue. And his whole theory was, I'm going to smuggle the air rights over um, Grand Central Terminal, uh, smuggle them through the tunnels up to 46th Street and pop them on top of my building. That's how I'm going to get the tallest building in the world. The city's response, over my dead body. It's Lydia Deutsch. Uh, she was the chair of this. So, boy, the city, gee, don't, don't they like these things? And even in, in the Bloomberg development boom, uh, where, you know, you had Amanda Burden <coughs> issue certain edicts, you know, it seemed like all those, they embraced tall buildings, but the MoMA building, too damn tall, chopped off 200 feet, uh, just like that. Uh, over at Atlantic Yards, Ratner wanted to build Miss Brooklyn, a big, brawny, um, uh, office building. Now, I, uh, Amanda thought that shouldn't be any higher than the Williamsburg Bank building. It was an arbitrary decision, but that's the decision she made. And uh, wonderfully enough, now that uh, you know, I remember Bruce Ratner telling me there was no office market in Brooklyn, and now they want to build uh, not on that site, but they want to transfer the air rights across the street and put up a big office town. Um, same thing in Queens, uh, arbitrary decision. But now we're in a new era, all of a sudden. You know, these tall, slender buildings uh, where the lights don't go on at night, uh, or may never go on. Uh, they, you know, the, the, we have an administration that says, well, we're confronting a problem of housing, and uh, affordable housing. And so I'm willing to trade off height and density for affordable units. And, and all of a sudden now we have, what, at least 20 buildings in excess of 900 feet. So many of them are right along 57th Street. Uh, so much better to sell those views of uh, Central Park. All of them claim to be either the tallest building in the world, the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere, the tallest building in Soho, the tallest building on 54th Street, or what's the most finite one? I, I, I don't remember, but you know, all of them selling. I don't, I'm not sure what the rules are anymore. I, I, I now turn it over to our speaker <laughs> and say, well, am I crazy? You know, I'm, I'm not a zoning lawyer. I'm not an urban planner. Um, I'm just a reporter. You know, we usually get it wrong. So uh, do I have this wrong? Is the city better off now? Or is uh, everything going haywire for reasons uh, beyond our control? Take it away. And, I mean, you can also <laughs> riff on whatever you want. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I don't have a stopwatch, but let's try to keep it to a strict five minutes so we can go out to the crowd. Oh, oh the answer to your question, Charlie, is that unequivocally it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, um, what, the, the, the remarks I have, uh, the point I want to make is, uh, one of the reasons we're doing this here at Columbia is uh, in the architecture school, every single program, one way or another, has to come to grips with zoning, whether you're in the architecture program, the urban design program, planning, preservation. The zoning cuts across. It, it's always in the background. It's always there. And what makes zoning so frustrating is it at once looks like it's very clear. It has rules to it. And then, as Charlie points out, it doesn't have rules to it. It, 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 it seems to, things seem to, um, uh, to slip. Um, 
And I, when I when I can make this, I went and look, looked up some some history of the the, the 1916 zoning ordinance. The 1916 zoning ordinance, by the way, zoned New York for it, it, they kind of overestimated a little bit. They zoned it for 55 million people, um, and uh, they, they missed a bit. But um, the 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 other thing that 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 I was surprised to find was that. Between the passage of that zoning ordinance in 1916 and just about when the City Planning Commission was established in 1940, there were almost 1,400 amendments uh, made to that zoning ordinance. Almost from day one, uh, it, it, was, it was being changed and amended. The exact number was 1,371, but you know, who counts? Um, and, uh, and most of them were used, and, uh, and then they were both. But the other part of it was, they were, the, 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 the political control was borough by borough, because remember, New York only became uh, a city in 1898. So in 1916, there was still a very um, county, you know, borough president orientation. And you read the thing, well, what would happen is somebody would come to me and say they needed to do something. I would talk to the borough engineer, and we would talk to the borough president. They'd go to the board of estimate, and then we'd, we'd change it. That was, um, so in some sense, things haven't changed. They're, they're, they're you know, it only looks like uh, it, it, it's clear about things, but then, um, but then it, uh, it, 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 in the end, it, it's always a, a political and economic dialogue. But the only point I will make, I mean, I can talk more about the history, but the only point I would make about the thing that, that interests me currently is in the 1916s only, there was a provision that you could, um, that if you had two adjacent lots, you could, you could, for the purpose of building a tower, you could, you could uh, mer merge them. And that was sort of almost an afterthought. By the time the 1961 zoning came along, by 1961 zoning, uh, the innovation was that every site had, a, had an FA or had a four area ratio on it. But um, you could, you could, um, two, two, um, two adjoining properties could be, could, could be merged. It got, it got cleaned up. It, at first, it said if you have a long-term lease on one and you own the other, then you could still do it. But then, if the leasee sells the property, what happens? So they clean that up. Uh, and then, with uh, with uh, historic preservation, they said, well, you could also move development rights across the street in you know, uh, uh, diagonally and, and so on. The the what? But what has happened has been since then uh, uh, this this uh, this notion of uh, the ability to transfer development rights has gone from an afterthought. To being the tail that wags the dog, all of the buildings that Charles talks about were, um, to some extent, involved the ability to, to do these things. And what I've learned is that you can't, you can't know what can go up on any site in New York if all you know is what's in the zoning code and the zoning map. Unless you know what other deals have been said about it, you, you, can't, you can't predict. Um, and the, and, and get the, the, the concern I have is that because Real estate is also is not just something that we use, but it also becomes a store of value, an asset, a way a, a, for asset holding. What what actually happened is on Wednesday the front page of the Financial Times uh, announced that the Bank of Japan had now was now had a, a negative interest rate. It's following some of the other banks. We have a glut of of global um, savings and not enough investment, and so people are looking for places to park value. And, um, and what simply happens is it, uh, real estate developers build buildings to maximize their return. They don't necessarily want to build the tallest building in the world. They want to build a building that will have the, 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 the light, the air, the square footage that will, that will work for them. But what is happening is we are getting these, these large buildings. City planning argues cogently, look, we haven't changed the zoning envelope. So one of the challenges is, does it matter? Does what Charles said really matter? Um, does it, uh, what we, we, you have to get to the point, and we'll open it up, we'll talk about it later, but uh, what would Jane say? What would Jane Jacobs say? And uh, I think you can argue this either way on, on this one, but, but I think it's, it's some of the issues we have to take up, that when, when all the, when, when the, 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 you know, the asset value begins to exceed the, the, the other urban values, um, what are the implications for urban planning? I'll stop with that. Good, uh, in, in the interest of brevity. Uh, let's start at the far end with the practitioners and all and, and go down the line. Uh, your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, well, the, you've raised the 
question of zoning, uh, uh, particularly with respect to its most, I guess, its most recent outlandish, you know, uh, debatable uh, outcome, and that is these uh, super tall buildings. And the super tall buildings happen to be luxury condominiums, and they happen to be very, very, the products of very, very for-profit motivated developments. However, that, and you know, everything you say about it is true. Everything that Elliot says about it is true. They are there for profit maximization, uh, and, um, and, and there's no stopping them. The, I'd like to look at zoning in a slightly, from a slightly different angle, and that is, you know, for all those buildings that occur for either super rich or even commercial buildings, think of all the thousands of units, housing units, that are built for us, for the people who are actually residents, who buy their home, who invest in their home, and that is here in New York, let's not be New York centric, but let's think about other cities where zoning is implemented, and I call zoning essentially the guardian of household wealth. The guardian of household wealth occurs in this way. It's not just about the height with zoning, it's about the usage, right? That is a key thing. It's about setback, site coverage, the ability, the quality of, uh, of the experience of the site. So if that's your home, the quality of that experience is going to be, in this American capitalist society, is going to be reflected in the value of your home. Household wealth in America is predominantly based, it's not the same in Germany, it's not the same in many other parts of the world, but it is predominantly based in the value of the own, of the ownership of a home. So therefore, what maintains the quality or the, uh, the potential for appreciation of that value of the home, and therefore the guardianship of the household wealth, and that is essentially zoning. Zoning that precludes a use that is antithetical to the enjoyment of the property by the by the household resident uh, in of, of that of that site. Uh, so therefore, I think zoning has it, yes, it may have begun as a reaction, uh, very very reactionary, uh, well, very very reactionary actually, uh, and focused on height. I'm not that interested in the height question. I really think, you know, it's a Freudian thing, it's an acrophobic thing, go get some therapy, get over it, right? And then the way in which the variations are done and the, you know, I like a man to burden dearly, but you know, the notion of someone decides that visually it's all got to sit in line, I don't understand any objective in that. Uh, however, I think we are forgetting what we really can do with zoning for the community. I believe the community builds its real estate, even the commercial development that occurs is part of the community building its real estate. The community builds its, its creates or delivers its built environment as a socio-economic process by which it makes manifest its own values and social aspirations. So therefore, Zoning is probably the only way in which a community is able to influence that, that social, the social part of that process. We have real estate markets, we have capitalism, we have essentially the economy determining the, uh, the economic part of that. But socially, for the society or the community to be able to uh, nominate and maintain and uh, take away the uncertainty that will discount the value of their own home or the place in which they uh, want to reside is through the use of zoning. So therefore my problem becomes not a question of whether zoning is good or bad or so on. Uh, is, it is a tool, is it the best tool we could have as a community? And then if it is a tool of the community which has the community's best outcome as its objective, who gets to formulate it? And how is that process achieved? Mike. I'll go next. I'm an environmental lawyer, and so I'll speak from that perspective. We're concentrating on the 100th anniversary of the zoning code. For 40 of those years, zoning has been yoked to the environmental review process. 
the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CEQA, was enacted in 1975. It requires environmental impact statements for any significant discretionary action. And so most discretionary, non as of right uh, real estate uh, development in the city goes through CEQA, either uh, uh, through getting a negative declaration, meaning no EIS, or having to get a full EIS. Uh, throughout almost its entire life, CEQA has been accused of being a tremendous burden on development and unnecessarily slowing things down and making them uh, more expensive. Uh, it's often blamed for delays that have little or nothing to do with CEQA, uh, but it's out there. Uh, CEQA has its ardent proponents uh, for, among the environmentalists, its die-hard opponents in the development community. There has been surprisingly little dispassionate academic study about the positive and negative effects of, of the statute, which plays such an important role in the, uh, in the land use process. I think one in, uh, illustrative exercise is to look at the projects that have managed uh, to get through without any secret review. Uh, so these very tall buildings that everyone has spoken about are as of right, they haven't required any discretionary review at all. If they did, I think that many of them probably would not uh, have been approved because I wouldn't call opposition to them Freudian. I, I, I think the word Trumpian may be more Trumpian. Trumpian. <laughs> that's, that's even more put. Yeah. <laughs> in, in looking at these uh, at these buildings, but they they completely avoided this. Uh, what I think may be the single most environmentally consequential decision that was made in New York City in the last several decades was the closure of the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island, because that led to the construction of a large number of solid waste transfer stations, mostly in low-income communities, a great increase in truck traffic, a great increase in the city's deficit, all kinds of negative uh, impacts. That also avoided any kind of uh, secret review. On the other hand, some very major developments have gone through and have undergone secret review. The reconstruction of the World Trade Center site um, uh, went through fairly quickly, and that uh, and that review, and I was involved in it for, for Silverstein, I think yielded a lot of environmental improvements in the way the project uh, uh, the project uh, was done. We've seen the, the extension of the number seven subway line, Hudson Yards, all went through the EIS process, uh, City Field, the new Yankee Stadium, on and on. Projects do get built, uh, notwithstanding that uh, uh, that onerous uh, uh, set of requirements. I've been involved over the years in maybe five or six different committees to try to come up with ways of expediting or smoothing out the CEQA process. We invariably labor mightily and deliver a mouse. It's very difficult to find uh, ways to uh, make the process more efficient and still uh, uh, preserve its, its core purposes. There have been uh, a couple of statutory innovations in related areas that have succeeded in, uh, in speeding up the process of project approval but keeping it rational. Um, in somewhat different areas, something called the Public Communications Act of 1996 uh, was able to speed up the process of the of review and approval of cellular telephone towers, for example. Uh, in December, Congress passed a statute that almost nobody knows about yet called the FAST Act. It was a, a part of the highway uh, authorization bill that is designed to expedite federal infrastructure project uh, uh, approvals, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, the final thing I wanted to, uh, uh, to say before Charlie delivers the hook um, is that I think that the secret process is very well suited for addressing a looming threat that people have not uh, started confronting seriously yet, and that is sea level rise. Uh, the uh, state uh, uh, legislature required the state environmental department to come up with official sea level rise projections. The draft that is out uh, uh, says that uh, by the end of the century, there is a 10% chance of, of a sea level rise of 72 inches. That's more than six feet in New York City. People are going to have to start thinking seriously about the effect that that has on, on planning and design and where people can and cannot build buildings. I think that the environmental impact review process uh, is a very good procedural mechanism for thinking more systematically about that and thinking about what kind of planning world do we need to be in 
in view of the uh, uh, likelihood of uh, the, or the, the certainty of, of real sea level rise and the, and the real possibility of significant sea level rise. Okay. Uh, Raquel, you were in the belly of the beast. Well, first uh, of all, I want to say, I mean, I am so impressed that so many people came to this sexy <laughs> I am so impressed. You know, I know we're all so lucky that we're talking about zoning, not about the political process today. <laughs> but uh, I am going to, I am concerned about what you were talking about, about high buildings, but I will be an advocate for what the good things about New York zoning is today from my experience. And one of the things that uh, I will uh, discuss is that, for instance, Manhattan, as opposed to Dubai, which I visited two weeks ago, where Dubai has a lot of beautiful architectural buildings, each one 80 stories, 90 stories, and there is no there there. There is no way to walk from one building to another, and that's very true about Pudong in Shanghai, where you have the most extraordinary architectural masterpieces. Today there's the Shanghai Tower that we just designed by Gensler, beautiful. But if you want to go to Central Park, which they call Central Park, you have to cross eight lanes of traffic. And, and I'm going back to New York zoning. When I first started in the city of New York, there were six big, very big books, all very shiny, that were the plans for New York City. Those big books that were prepared as a, as a plan, not through zoning, were shelved the minute that they were printed. I don't know if anybody remembers it. Magnificent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that that is, and, it, and instead, instead zoning has become the planning tool in New York City. And I think it has a lot of advantages. One, it has flexibility. You can change the zoning. In 10 years, the zoning is not going to be what it is today. But in terms of what was good about what we did in zoning and city planning at the time, is instead of the 1916 zoning, which said what not to do, don't build uses of commercial next to residential. Don't do this, don't do that. The whole attitude to it was what can we do to improve the city? As a result, we did some things that I think are responsible for the kind of life that you see in Manhattan and in Brooklyn today, where the streets are full of life, where these towers want to be because of the public realm, because of what's on the street. And it's not an ad hoc thing. It is really a very strong planning idea. So let's just look at the work that we did with Holly White on public places, on plazas, which were an incentive for developers who got more density to create open spaces. Today in Maytown we have 500 public open spaces. Some of them are not so good, some of them are excellent. Some of them are covered, like the IBM covered pedestrian space. And some of them need a lot of work because it's enforced, by the, unfortunately, by the building department, which doesn't always uh, enforce the laws. A regulation that mandates retail along major residential uh, zoning areas. Instead of blank, unfriendly walls, the mandatory requirement to plant trees every new development, the, the uh, zoning ordinance around the subway stations, 100 feet around subway stations, which requires development to bring into their development the subway, like in the Bloomberg building on 59th Street or like in uh, City Corp on 53rd Street. These things that improve the pedestrian room have been part of the things that make the city a, a city, a, and I think that we can't forget about it. Now, this issue of incentives, which created more density in exchange for several of the things I was talking about, and many more, which I have only five minutes, so I'm not going to go into it, but just an example, sidewalk cafes were not permitted. Side, we are now 1,200 sidewalk cafes in New York City. 
There was one when I first came into the city. So I think that making the city lively, friendly, <coughs> safer, is part of what the zoning did. Needless to say, the special zoning districts, which we now have 57 ones, that are actually uh, presenting unique issues in areas such as Times Square, which permits, which mandates the signs all over Times Square, which was in danger at the time when Philip Johnson was trying to build three towers all in marble with big lobbies for corporate uh, America, and the transfer of air rights, which you call smuggling air rights, and I will say advantages air rights, <laughs> which allow uh, people to, uh, uh, to transfer air rights from existing theaters in the whole area of the theater district. These are the things that, in my opinion, have been big advantages. They have been copied in many cities around the country, and I think that we should deal with some of the issues that we were talking about here, but with a positive uh, attitude towards codes and regulations which actually we need. Otherwise, the city will look like Dubai. Okay. <clears throat> uh, a, a good point, you know, the, uh, on, on how it shapes the city, and, and uh, of late, I guess, for the good. But um, a question, if our first speaker raised the question, for whom? Who controls the process? I think that's an interesting question. Uh, let me just ask something. The, the holiday chair, is that the holiday? I wish I think it were it all about holiday planning, but it is not. Uh, Mark Holiday is a former. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. It's over. Because I was going to use an example of uh, one Vanderbilt, but. Well, you can. But that would be a pretty. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I, I talk to him about it constantly, yes. Uh, what well, a great story. But um, I, I, I'm not supposed to be the riffer here, but so why don't we talk about that for a few minutes, is, is just who does control the process? I mean, the, the zoning law was written, and then when we had the board <laughs> estimate, there was always this wonderful game that was played where, um, you know, the, 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 if the project was in Manhattan and the Manhattan Borough President would be pressured by the local groups, and they'd say, oh, no. And uh, you know, there was always an arrangement that the developer would come in and say, I want to, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to get stuck on hype, but let's say he says, I want to build 100. And you know, in the course, 100 story building. In the course of the Board of Estimate meeting, you'd see it get lapped off. Well, you know, truth be told, the developer never wanted to build 100 stories, he wanted to build 75, but, you know, the public, when you use the word community, I always think of the public, but in this case, so the public is clamoring for one thing, and, and well, let's throw them a bone, and the developer still got what he wanted, uh, nine times out of 10, and if there were enough votes on the Board of Estimate, the, the Manhattan borough president could say no, and therefore please his, his or her constituents, and, uh, and they, the, the, in this case, the developer would get what they want. Yeah, a, the, Is that, do you think that's a jaundiced view of the uh, process? No, I, I, I think it, uh, I think, you know, Raquel's point is also well taken. It, it, it's, it, it, it is, it is com it, it's complex, but, but here, who makes um, land use policy in New York? You say, well, there's zoning, but um, there's something called the BFA, uh, the, the Board of Standards and Appeal. And this goes all the way back to 1916. Um, and, and the essential notion was um, it didn't matter what zoning said. All that matters is what BSA is going to say. <laughs> and the other problem becomes it doesn't matter how we zone. Um, it matters how the building department decides to enforce or not enforce the, the code. So um, when we talk about how effective policy or substantive policy as opposed to statutory policy, I think that's, that was the game at, 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 the, you know, at, the, uh, uh, at the old Board of Estimates. I think the, the, the way the game is played has changed, but uh, in the end, you, you do have, there are certainly homeowner groups tend to want to have areas, as Patrice was saying, they want, they want, they want certain protections. 
Um, commercial um, interests want, um, they, they want certain change, they want other things. <coughs> Developers need other things. And they, so this, ga this game of musical chairs uh, goes on, but I think that, that you know, that every, each of us raised a different issue. The, the horse, the, the problem I raised is that um, all of a sudden, all of these other issues are getting swamped by the fact that all this money is looking for safe haven. The IRS, as of March 1st, has told uh, the title companies they have to reveal the true owners of Manhattan, New York, Manhattan, not even Brooklyn. You can still, <coughs> if you still want the money in Brooklyn, folks, you can't want it in Manhattan anymore, or Miami. Don't even, but the, 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 the point is that uh, uh, I, there's, no, there's no right or wrong answer, but the reality is uh, what becomes planning use policy is an amalgam of these, of, of these things. The players change a little bit, but the, the game goes on the same way. I think, first of all, forget about the Board of Estimate. That's history. It doesn't work like the Board well, of Estimate uh, anymore. Okay. Today, we have 59 community planning boards. The planning boards are a very serious group of citizens who volunteer and work extremely hard on trying to either uh, add, approve a, anything that comes through zoning. Now, they're not, they, the city planning that make, creates the zoning doesn't have to listen to the community planning boards. But because of the politics in New York, where the mayor is being s selected every four years, the community <coughs> planning boards are a very, very strong political group. I can tell you because I, I go to a meeting so often about anything from benches to buildings. And so I think there is some participation of citizens in what happens in zoning. Well, and I given know that they, five community boards oppose the rezoning for one Vanderbilt, how does that match and, I, up? and as I said, I'm not, say, I'm not saying they always succeed, but I often they do succeed. I mean, it is, it is basically at least a voice that you can't do without. If I came now, I'm working on a, some public space, which is a minor little space, which I won't tell you because you all know it, and uh, we went to the community planning board and they get involved in every single detail and the city is listening to them. Now, the power of the developer, that's a different story. And uh, it's very interesting, in today's paper, there is a whole article about uh, elements that exist on sidewalks. You may have read it. And uh, about the city making money of things that are standing on sidewalks. And it says, and it, it gives uh, different amounts, like the big nine on 57th Street play, pays $12,500 <coughs> to, to the, port, to the uh, uh, transit authority because they own the sidewalk. But Trump, who has a clock on Fifth Avenue, pays $300 a year. So what I'm saying is there is something there to question about how things work in the city. As far as what you were saying about, and, and Patricia was saying about the people who don't live in the city, I think that's an issue, a big issue. It's a very big issue and, and I think we have to deal with it. And I think the high buildings, I think we have to deal with it. But at least I am happy that in this necklace of different buildings, there is something that connects them. 57th Street is still a street with retail along it. Mm -hmm. it. It has all these big buildings, but it has something that connects it, and that's only because of zoning. Because if you let the developers do a high building, they would like to have a, a gateway, which is a huge lobby with nothing in it, just to present the building, but that's not what the city allows. Michael, were you chomping at the bit there? Well, I was, I was going to say that I think ordinarily the, the default choice for who controls it is the developer, uh, uh, unless something comes in to take a greater interest in it. Sometimes the state comes in and supersedes what's going on, and the state is a very important decision maker in many of these projects. If a project becomes locally politically sensitive, then of course the community boards and the city council members and so forth play. Uh, uh, play a major role, but I do think that some of the local control has been diluted since the demise of the Board of Estimate. I think that that was a whole uh, different era than what we have now, and obviously with de Blasio's focus on affordable housing, 
I mean, it's been a struggle, which you've written a lot about, but he's certainly trying to exercise greater control over these choices. Patrice, did you have? Well, just to continue uh, with the, the theme, I think, you know, that zoning, zoning is uh, a good start uh, for all the reasons that the panel have described. Uh, I, I just don't think that, one, it's democratic enough, and two, I don't think it, I think it's too easily hijacked or overrun by other interests, and that may be the interest of the, of the uh, developer, or the interests of, you know, community boards are still voluntary. They're not elected representatives. So, you know, quite frankly, I'm not so sure. I, I always think the, the volunteers are the best guardians. Uh, but they are very, you know, many of them are very fine people, of course. But I think that uh, we, to say that we have, uh, that we've achieved a lot in zoning really sets us up for saying New York City is growing so rapidly and, and is being pushed by the force of capital and you know, capital is going to be a system that we're going to continue to play in. Uh, what do we do as a community of New Yorkers? And I use, the, I use the resident or the homeowner as really just a symbol, but essentially anyone who occupies space in New York essentially has value in that occupation, in that, in that, that uh, activity of being an occupier of that. Whether you're a renter, <coughs> When you rent, you take a lease that gives you the right to, uh, of the enjoyment of that space. If you're a worker in a firm, you go to work with the right to be able to do your job in that space and so on. So we're talking about every citizen or every member of the public uh, being, uh, being essentially uh, vulnerable to uh, forces that can uh, damage their, the, the value of their space that they occupy or participate in in the city. So, you know, I, I would say zoning has been um, a very interesting thing, uh, a very interesting mechanism, uh, but uh, as, as Raquel says, we failed to have a city plan. Why is that? Uh, why did the community not say, we need the certainty of a city plan? Uh, anyone who knows basic economics knows that uncertainty results in a discount to the value. So not knowing what are the planning, what's the planning vision for a city or for an environment, a built environment that you're going to be part of for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years is a discount to what you are currently experiencing. So I think that um, I would like to have a discussion about what more could we do how can we stop this process by which a community makes manifest its built environment that should be with the agency of planners, architects, financiers, developers, construction people, the whole works. They're the agents of the community in this process. How can we re-establish a process whereby the community is able to manage that process and not be hijacked by one of these agents. Elliot, why don't you take that? I wanted to, uh, uh, so actually made me think of the, the expression that I wanted, as of right, um, New York, um, what we do, we pride ourselves on the fact that, look, if we make the rules clear and you own a piece of property, you, as long as you conform to the, to the zoning of that, you can do certain things as of right. The, the problem becomes um, when, when the rules all of a sudden change, then whose rights take precedent over whose rights? And think about what, what the teacher is saying. So the, the, the reason the mayor had this um, outgoing of all the city, of the, the, the community boards was essentially they said, we have a set of rules. We have something called contextual zoning. Yeah. Um, these things are put in place. And now you're saying you're going to make a text, a text change, not a map change, but just a text change, which means they didn't have to deal with environmental review on it. And, um, and all of a sudden, I've lived here for X years, and now all of a sudden, the, the, the environment around me could be changed as of right by somebody coming in from outside who's a developer. So the, this term as of right, um, which on one hand is very uh, attractive because it says this is the rule. This is the way we do things. But then, if you contextualize it in this amalgam of 
of, of different of different groups making decisions, you can understand why all of a sudden the mayor gets blindsided by the fact that everyone said, uh, we have we thought we had some rights about the, what was going to happen here, and you're saying no, we're going to we're going to change all that overnight. Right. I, so I, I, I think like the mayor had another talking, problem in yeah. just never talking to the community before they unveiled the plan. But uh, what, so what would be the solution, Michael? What what? How do you strengthen the democratic oversight? Because uh, there's all kinds of things happening. I mean, in in the time that I've covered New York real estate, uh, there, there's been a, a profound change. It used to be that at the top of the feeding frenzy were the commercial developers, and then came the residential developers. But and and so a, a property had more value. Uh, the, the reason for this is because the pro property have more value as an office building. Blah, 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 rents. Uh. So now, in the last, I don't know, 10 years, there's been this huge change where residential is, is driving the situation. So, so, so residential developers are gobbling up all the, all the different land, driving up prices. The tall towers have, have uh, driven the price of land up to the point where rental developers can't compete or commercial developers can't compete. So that the city, if, if, it, if it just progresses along this path, um, the, you may end up with a city that you don't want, that you don't recognize. Uh, because, uh, yeah, a lot of people are moving in. And New York is, uh, I don't know if people realize this, there's more people in New York today than ever before. Uh, and that's been true for quite a while now. And they keep coming. Well, they gotta work somewhere. So there's gotta be space for buildings that people can work in, whether they be uh, industrial or, or office buildings. Or, I mean, a lot of the tech sector, they, they like, um, what I would call, uh, what was my phrase? Um, uh, sort of, uh, 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 I guess yeah. Google way, I, I'm going to be a little bit of a, since we are, we're not supposed to necessarily agree, I just want to remind everybody that when Rockefeller Center was built, everybody was against it. All the people who lived around it were against mm -hmm. it. So this word democracy in planning is a, is a thing that we have to think a lot about. Because most of the people don't want another high building next to them because of the view. Many people would not, you know, like the Rockefeller Center, would not encourage some of the things that were, I think, pretty, pretty good for the city. So I think that's something that we should think about. As far as the uses that you were talking about, residential and commercial, the zoning uses basically tells you that you can build in some areas either residential or commercial, and the market determines whether it's residential or commercial, or the city decides that it wants to create more places for offices and they rezone Hudson Yards. I mean, for example, Hudson Yards is basically the zoning tool to move office buildings to the west side, together with the subway number seven, etc. So the uses are controlled somewhat, but I think that because the market in real estate changes all the time, it would, I don't, I'm not sure how much we should dictate in terms of uses where they should be. However, there are other things we could do. For example, many of these high buildings that are built now start building their residential units on the 12th floor. 12th floor is mechanical equipment because the zoning does not, is not, cons I mean mechanical equipment is not considered FAR, floor area. So therefore, many of these buildings, including for instance the building on 60th Street that uh, Zeckendorf is building, it starts at the 12th floor. 12th floor are concrete. All concrete, hardly used. You don't need 12 floors of mechanical for a building. And the residential starts at 13 or 14th floor. Mm -hmm. That creates huge buildings. I mean, that's just a little loophole that the city rail easily can actually deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure 
I'm not sure how to deal with some of the other things, particularly the issue of air rights. I'm not sure we can dictate who should live in a building, whether it should be you know, a guy from Russia or China or whatever, but I think that we can deal with the issue of air rights. They limit the air rights so the site is really as of right and you know how much you can be limited. And as a legal matter, you could easily legislatively impose uh, uh, restrictions so that buildings over a certain height require discretionary approval. New York That's is true. one of the few That's cities true. in the world that has no effective height limitations on buildings in the central business district, and so they keep on going up and up. Around 2000, there was there was a lot of discussion about imposing that. Uh, I hate to keep giving his name, but Trump was building a big building by the UN, uh, and, and it led to a, some opposition and talk about imposing height limits at that time, but it was it was never it was never done. Uh, uh, on your broader question of how do we put more democracy into the land use process, obviously there's a trade-off between uh, democratic oversight and, and, the, and, and the, the speed and economy with which buildings could be built. Community boards are purely advisory. You could give them some power. Or you could say that if they, uh, if they vote against something, a super majority vote is needed at the city planning commission or the city council or something like that. You could, you could invest them with some actual teeth beyond what they have now. They, have, they certainly have influence now, but they, you could give them a lot more if you thought that that was a good way to democratize. Okay. Uh, I was going to, oh, yes, I was going to say. Okay. So, uh, I'm sure you're all eager to ask questions and uh, grill the panelists. Sir? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for, for this discussion. Uh, I'm sort of curious about the environmental stuff because one thing that is very absent in zoning is any clear discussion of the environment. Absolutely, you can down zone by, you know, in a wetland or you can zone something to be, you know, un unbuildable. Uh, but there's no direct uh, discussion of it. And sort of New York, you know, since Sandy and Irene has been trying to figure out what to do, uh, we've put a lot of public housing on the waterfront, sort of like out in the Rockaways. Uh, so you know, we have to figure out what to do there. But other cities like Miami have really upzoned on the water so that you can sort of defray the costs of, of flooding and building really big towers. So there's sort of a couple ways you can go. Uh, do you have any sort of insight into you know how a city should proceed? Uh, what we should do in New York? I don't think we have uh, much of an idea right now. Because just discretionary zoning actions are subject to that kind of review, and whether it's a map amendment or a text amendment, it can require environmental review. Sometimes it gets away with a negative declaration, but we certainly have the procedural devices uh, in place. And now, um, New York City is actually leading the country in many ways in systematically thinking about sea level rise as part of the environmental impact review process. It is now customarily done in the city's city uh, uh, secret technical manual uh, uh, calls for that. We have seen adjustments in the design uh, of buildings to reflect that. I think it's not yet fully reflecting what the projections are, but I think we're definitely heading in the right direction on that front. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm a planner and I teach here. Um, and I also have devoted too much of my time, uh, though I think it's valuable, to community boards. Um, and also have had the pleasure of going up against and cooperating with Raquel as recently as three weeks ago when she came. When she came to review on behalf of a developer a public space, one of those bonus public spaces that was established to have public space and in return the building got higher. And over the years, and probably in the original design, the public space didn't work so well. And so now there's flexibility and, and changes in it. But okay, I have Two more observations, then two or three questions for each one very quickly. Um, when zoning in 1916 was, was established and how it continued was in part based upon separation of uses. Hence, residential, commercial, manufacturing with the basic assumption being that you had to separate uses because some uses were noxious 
the stable, the smelter, the whatever. And also, it was better to have the separations for quality, for quality of life. The fact that the city did begin with what? With people working near each other in factories and so on, but usually poor people, right? And so the separation occurred for a lot of health reasons, for economic reasons, and so on. Now, in these last years, what do we see in the economy? We find that, that the city has been growing, and cities do not have as industry. I mean, we all may want it, and manufacturing, but instead, what's going on? Live work, technology, and you can have residential and what? Um, a commercial or even manufacturing, if it's Google or something else, in the same building. The zoning code is only trying to catch up with the changes in the economy and Columbia and other places. All of us should be working hard to find ways to have zoning and have a practice of it to be catching up with a changing economy and with a new work and so on. So I think, that, so that's that's part of it uh, as well. I just want to ask a couple of, of questions of each one. First, I would ask Elliot, and obviously anyone else, um, if, um, if the buildings uh, on 57th or on 32nd or wherever uh, would not have height limits and, they could, and it could be mandated for affordable housing, would that be an, uh, a, a trade-off that you were willing to accept. 900 feet, affordable housing, would that be a better, would it be a trade-off as compared to luxury housing? I ask that question in part because this mayor is asking the entire city to make that trade-off because he is saying the biggest goal is housing, affordable housing. And the aim of what he's doing is to upzone East New York, East Harlem, Jerome Avenue, and many other places. It's not going to, we're not going to get upzoned here in Manhattan and so on. But he's saying you have, I have to have density in order to have housing. I would ask Elliot, is that a trade-off that we should have density and height and so on? But if it were for the a better <coughs> social, uh, good, and then I have one other question, I think, for, for Rich. Okay, if I, I, I don't want to keep talking, but I, I would love to know the answer. It's, it's one of those, it's one of those uh, good, uh, uh, it depends questions. Not quite, uh, but go Yeah, on. no, uh, uh, I, I think the, the, what, what the problem, what, what, what happened here is because we no longer have any forms of, of social housing, public housing, uh, stuff, we, don't, we don't do anything, all we have is the market. And, and so what the, what the mayor has to do is the mayor has to figure out uh, how, if he wants to pursue uh, a, you know, a social good, he, he, he has to become an ideological loss leader to get something else to happen. In other words, he, 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 to, to get that to happen. If he said all the, um, all the new, all that, all that new uh, uh, hype was all gonna be just affordable housing, I think you would, you would find that you wouldn't have many developers who would be takers. For that, but he is asking uh, that that it can be a higher be building. Some, yes. uh, wait, 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 but I'm read, sorry. But if you read, if you also if you read the text, it also says if it proves not to be profitable, you don't have to do it. Um, you know, the, the, you can you can go to to BSA if, if if it's not profitable, but you can keep the you can keep the bulk anyway. So I mean, there there are problems, but we'll put that aside because that that's not the, your, your question is. Would we trade off um, more of these tall buildings if we got more, uh, we expanded the supply of affordable housing? And the issue, the reason I said it depends is because the issue that I begin to think about is the question that Charlie raised earlier about uh, the, the whole, and, and that Raquel raised about the notion of the connections, the life on the street. And I, I'm not convinced that, that putting things all the way up in the air necessarily does that. that you, what, once you and I talked, Charlie, I remember you saying, one of the problems of 57th Street becomes you build these things, no one lives in them. Even with the with the retail, no one's going to be on the street if no if no one's coming in and out of these places. So it was a speculative um, thought, but but so I, my answer is what I the reason I say it depends is because I'm not sure as a, a matter of urban design and and creating the vitality of urban street life um, uh, just to say that it's going to be cheap housing. 
uh, necessarily makes it better. Just one quick question, Mitch. In view of the fact that New York is trying to deal with the, the, the sea rise uh, uh, sea, uh, level and so on, and New York is really doing some planning, in what way would you say that the planning should include changes in zoning as a tool in order to promote the necessary coping with climate change and sea level rise? I think we need to allow both to discourage the development of the most vulnerable, the lowest lying areas, and to allow higher densities in the areas where these uses would go. Uh, a lot of the uh, dialogue is just where can't you build, uh, but if uses are displaced from certain places, they have to go someplace else. And if we want them in the city, which we do, I think we need to have, allow higher densities in some other areas of the city to provide that. Also, please note that high density doesn't mean they have to all be pencil towers. You can do high density at six, seven, eight stories. There's a lot of interesting, nice urban design, and the city is full of neighborhoods that, that, that demonstrate that. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question for Mr. Ramadi. Uh, in the last 15 years, the city has struggled with these. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. So in the last 15 years, New York City has struggled with these very complex land use conflicts between manufacturing and residential development. And we've tried IBZs, and now we're looking at creative manufacturing districts. So have we reached the limits of special purpose district zoning or contextual zoning? Well, especially if you're talking about special districts, they're not necessarily, they don't deal necessarily with a manufacturing issue. A special district would be in Italy where we created high density low rise. So it doesn't have to do with what you're talking about manufacturing. Um, I don't think the city dealt well with that issue that you're talking about. We tried in Soho to, to keep employees on certain, certain size of sites. We tried not to areas with manufacturing. I think the manufacturing issue is really a world issue. It's a, it's a, it's a thing that, that is moving out of the city, and I'm not sure zoning can deal with it. I think we can deal with it in many other ways, but I'm not sure that zoning is the real tool to deal with that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I would disagree with that. Um, oh, good. <laughs> I, I, and I think that we're at an inflection point for this city. Uh, New York is one of the few, I think, international cities. And so we're sort of being shaped by many. It's not just simply supply and demand here. And I, I think to a great extent we're going down what some people call the, the, the European model maybe best exemplified by Paris, where the city is really for the rich and, the, and tourists, and that the working class and immigrants are thrust out into the suburbs where you have a built-in 20 or more percent unemployment. This sometimes, you know, that generates a lot of alienation, sometimes expresses itself as uh, in riots. And I, I, I remember when I first, started writing about the city, uh, developers would, I, this is a long time ago, uh, in the 80s, and um, uh, developers would say to me, what, what's the fucking garbage center doing in Manhattan? It should be, should be out in Sunset Park. And, and the printing district, what, what, what's, it doesn't belong down there by uh, Canal. It should be somewhere else. And um, uh, uh, you know, Columbia is expanding into an area where you have warehouses and some uh, assembly and, and other uses there, uh, as well as meatpacking on, on um, 125th. Um, so nowadays, that, that was then, right? All these things abandon ship. <coughs> Thrust them, throw them out of Manhattan, they should be in the outer borough. But in the Bloomberg period, they, they decided those things didn't belong in the outer boroughs either. So um, one, of, one of what I think one of the worst projects to arise from the Bloomberg <coughs> administration 
is out there in the Iron Triangle next to the Mets Stadium. Um, uh, where, you know, you had all these shops. Yes, it was very ramshackle. Yes, if it rained, you, you know, you had to put on boots and, and wade through the water to get to the shop. But here there were 1,700 people working. And these were hard to employ people that were making a living there. And you know, I, I, I remember a couple of years ago going out there, and it reminded me of 47th Street. People go to the Diamond District on 47th Street because there's all that center of gravity. And, and there's hawkers outside, you know, psst, psst, come here, we got a deal for you, and come in here and look at our shop. Well, they were doing the same thing there. People came from the tri-state area to get their tires repaired, their muffler, a new muffler, a new this, a new that. And, uh, and, and they, they came to this spot because they knew that they could get a good deal and you could sort of play off one shop against another. And these were really primitive shops, but people made a living there. And uh, those people are gone, and who knows what happens to, you know, if they've been able to find work again. The printing district, it, it, it was antiquated, you could argue, uh, but uh, I remember that the first time they tried to get rid of the printing district, a, a church, by the way, uh, tried to get rid of them, uh, you know, it was in the 80s. And so then there was a second effort in the 90s, and I, I was calling up all the shops in the 80s that had moved out. Let me tell you, none of them were in business because it, there was a, you know, a critical mass, and and that was abandoned. Uh, the garment, sh you know, some of the garment went out to um, uh, went out to Sunset Park, but let let's look at what happened in the garment district. Yes, if you were doing a hundred thousand pieces or you know two hundred thousand t-shirts, you're going to go to China, but who's manufacturing there now? And it, it, it's actually the high-end designers because they're not making 100,000 pieces. They're making 3,000 or 5,000, and they want to see it. They don't want to wait until the delivery from China and go, oh my god, they got the color wrong. Oh my god, the stitching's screwed up. Uh, but it's getting wiped out. And I don't think the city has done enough. It, it's not the same. We're not going to have large-scale manufacturing. But when I went, a couple of years ago, I then went to um, Greenpoint, where they have that Greenpoint Industrial Center, and there were people there making furniture, you know, uh, uh, for office furniture, low-cost stuff. And um, uh, I thought, oh, wow, that's really great. That's a use that people, we, we could use in the city. Well, last year, uh, I was up in uh, Kingston, but up on the Hudson, and I, I bumped, it was on a casino story, but I bumped into them. They had moved up there because the, the rents for manufacturing had, had uh, be, because of the idea that, that they would be rezoned for uh, residential, the rents had skyrocketed and they couldn't function in the city. And I think when those uses, when all those things are flung outside the city, the, the businesses can't exist. And so I really question the viability of a city. I mean, Paris is, I mean, London is the same thing. Um, and I think New York is following down that path where it's it, it increasingly it's a city for the wealthy. It started in Manhattan. Stuyvesant Town ain't gonna be what it was for the last 65 years. That's gone. And, and so the, the middle class is, is going farther and farther outside of the center city. And you know, ultimately, who knows? Maybe they'll be pushed outside the city. If the labor pool is outside the city, how do these businesses survive? I agree with you 100%. I just don't know that zoning can deal with it. I would like to see the flower market stay, the garment district stay. The question is, is there a way for zoning as a tool to deal with that? That's what I was questioning. Not the fact that we need the diversity. Well, the Bloomberg administration they announced a plan where they were going to uh, the they were going to uh, create yeah. <laughs> manufacturing districts, 
and there was going to be an ombudsman district. In the manufacturing district, you could be assured that there was not going to be a rezoning, and so there was no pressure on rents to go up, you know, because you just weren't going to get any other kind of user. And, and I don't think they ever implemented that. I remember going around, and, and the ombudsman district was sort of, well, maybe we will, maybe we won't. And, and then the, you know, the district said, well, when I started on. working. Wait, wait, we, sh we shouldn't. I, I want to talk. Wait, <laughs> you already had a question. I was going <laughs> to give you some answers. Yeah, I, I'm a land use lawyer and a student here now in urban planning. And I'm old enough to remember in the 80s when there were sliver buildings and there were prohibited prohibitions against sliver buildings going up. As a, as a citizen of New York and as a planner, I'm aggrieved by the slivers on 57th Street for the, for the, for the reason that they turn their back on the street and they don't engage the street life. And, and then there's the whole issue of the people that don't live here. It's sort of like the Plaza Hotel conversion, you know, in, in a microcosm, but in a, in a skinny way. The, the, the nature of the streetscape changes. As a, as a zoning lawyer, I, I think the, you know, the, unfortunately, the, 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 the horse is out of the stable for these existing sites that are, as of right. But any changes that have to be made, they have to be made in the zoning tax. There can be restrictions on air lot, air, um, zoning lot mergers to, to cap it at a certain percentage in those districts, like with these states where there are negative externalities, like shadows that are being cast upon Central Park. Um, I can't believe that if Jack Onassis were alive today, that MAS wouldn't be leading a much more aggressive <coughs> campaign against, you know, against the, uh, the super tolls on 57th Street, because that was the, uh, the issue that got down, shot down the... Actually, they did come out and they called for... Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, they, they, they called for a halt on the construction of towers over 600 feet tall. You can imagine the outrage that that sparked at Redmond. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not against tall towers. I, I just, uh, I think there's a lot of other things to consider. Mm, yeah. I'm sorry, did you no, have I, a question? I, I, just, yeah, uh, my, my, I think the basic point is what one Elliot made was that it's who's designing these things. And the zoning resolution is playing catch up, and CDC is playing catch up with these advances in building technology and the confluence of the advances in building technology that allow you to build very narrow buildings, very tall, uh, and the economic conditions that have motivated this and made them very, very profitable. Um, and is that it, it, there has to be some change in, in the zoning resolution to, to prevent this going forward. Who uh, I actually work at the New Sport Society, so uh, just wanted to say that we do have, a, you can go to our website, we have a uh, program wait, 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 called no the, commercial? the ICC on uh, 57th Street. Uh, but I do have a question. Uh, we're very interested in, in this 100th in anniversary. Um, when the original zoning code was written, many other cities all over the world emulated what New York did. Um, do you have specific examples uh, of other cities, you, you mentioned how Pudong and Dubai, there's are examples of ways not to do things. Is there anything that New York can learn from other places about the review process or to make a better built environment? Well, I, I think that there are some things in San Francisco that copied New York zoning but then improved on it. So for San Francisco, for instance, if you build an office building, you have to build a certain amount of residential within the office building. So that some ideas that have been around, I think, can be learned from other places. I'm sure there are many, many other things that can be learned from other cities. Just specific, if there are any specific just, examples. I, I just think of San Francisco yeah. uh, at this point. But of course, in Europe, there's a very different uh, feeling about the whole thing, about, about planning in general, and there is height limitations. There are many more streets that are close to traffic, which we're actually emulating, you know, which I think are, are a good thing. I think that the whole issue of new transportation modes like Uber and, uh, you know, Airbnb, those things, they have an influence on real estate, and we have to think about that. 
I think that's very important. I would add that San Francisco has been a leader in uh, with the existing building stock, for instance, requiring energy efficiency improvements in the existing stuff. We focus all on the new stuff, but there's a lot of old stuff that will be here for a very long time, and some of it is crumbling or it, it has lots of problems, and I think more attention to the existing stock that will continue to be around is warranted. Question that was almost my question, but maybe just to encourage more of the international outlook. I, I co-teach a course where students do case studies from cities around the world, looking specifically at residential zoning and evaluating them against sort of our current <coughs> challenges of flood and social issues and economic. So that the goal is with so many new cities expanding, new cities in themselves and expanding to new districts, what models do they have to look towards if they don't have planning agencies that have been doing this for 100 years? And what, what we show in the class is the easy model is sort of the, what I call the China model, a very rapid, very absolute form of zoning that's top down from the federal government mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to, to sort of look at other cities around the world and, and not necessarily mix and match, but see the different ways zoning can be used. And so I'm just encouraging more if you have comments on what, uh, what New York can share out of as well as the well, um, the comment, uh, it, it, it triggered, I don't know if it talks directly to what you said, but, but it, um, it picks up on something uh, Raquel said all the earlier. Um, New York from 1969 had zoning uh, without planning, really. You know, and, and, um, and if you ask, uh, and I think Raquel made a very articulate case for the way city planning looks at, at those changes, and they, they see it as planning. They, 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 they think of the, when they do that, they, they do a lot of uh, background work before they even begin. The problem that I see that comes in with and with and we, these changes, these larger changes, one is the image of who the city is for, you know, um, and, 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 um, and as, as, you, as, as you change it. The other issue is we have the same number of streets today we have in the 1811 plan was, was, was put to effect. But, um, but if, if you begin to um, bulk up and dense up the uses on the same rights of way, and you say you have to have space for taxis, yellow cabs, green cabs, Uber cabs, um, uh, uh, fresh direct is important, um, you know, uh, uh, FedEx, Amazon, FedEx. So all of a sudden, the, curb, the, the demand, and then sidewalks, and then you want bike lanes, um, what what be, what what begin, unfortunately begins to happen is there's a, a, um, a disconnect between thinking about uh, you know ur the urban design and, and the building and thinking about what the infrastructure um, can 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 reasonably bear in terms of a very livable city and one of the concerns that I have about this we, we never we, we don't quite think of that and I talk to transportation and say well what if we do curb spaces what cost money. Um, well, we can bid that out. It can go in the market. But if you do that, you then exclude people. Uh, you know that that, that the, the the thing that makes the city work is when you have access to uh, when the most people have the most access. Cities work the best. So it, it, you know that that uh, but, uh, but the, that's one of the concerns I have as we think about the reason we call this past this prologue is we're trying to say okay. We, we're, we're 100 years into this. Chicago immediately copied the New York zoning. That, that, uh, we then, of course, got um, regional, regional planning from them. But you know, there, there, were, there were these kind of interchanges. But the, the bigger issue, it seems to me, is now with the environment, with the level change, with the notion that we want a less, you know, less CO2, we want people less you know, in, internal combustion vehicles. Everyone's talking about self-driving cars. Uh, I mean, you know, autonomous vehicles. Um, we're going to be talking about autonomous buses, or how how to how to you know how to make the get more capacity on the street. So those, but it seems to me the the issue right now is is how do you even connect up what zoning is to these broader issues for the as we look ahead a hundred years, and you know the change in the way people live and work uh, are very different. Uh, you know, I write books. I write with people all around the world. I don't see them half the time, most of the time actually. I don't think I've never seen it at all. Um, you know, but so there, there's a, we were working very different ways, and, and I, that has to be, and, 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 but the one tool we have to do anything about it is our zoning. What could we be doing with it to address these other issues? And that's what I hope we do. This is the beginning of a discussion this year. Uh, how are we doing, Anton? 
half an hour. Mm -hmm. That's you, are you? <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I am a planner and uh, I am an elected official in Rochester. I'm going back to zoning and process. Um, a few municipalities in Rochester are looking into community um, agreement, uh, community benefit agreements. What is your experience with that? With community benefit agreement. Um, I'm, I'm not. Um, I always. You want the truth or intellectually satisfying answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the truth, the truth is, I don't think much of them. Um, uh, I think, you know, I think the, the things that communities often get from them are 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 are, are tokens, and, and that they don't that that what you want to deal with is, is that, that a lot of these things are, they're bigger than just land use zoning, and, and we they, we don't we don't we don't quite deal with them. So we, we have community benefits. For them. I'm I'm always for them. And, uh, Columbia engages in them, you know, uh, and we, we do them, but, but I, I really do, I don't see them as, as being, uh, whether, the one I always think about is, is um, they're supposed to build a, a, a water, a, a sewer treatment plant on 79th Street uh, on the Hudson River, uh, and uh, it's actually the 125th Street, actually, it's north of 125th yeah. Street. Uh, the community got a, a part. And on days when it doesn't snow, the park is great. Um, and, you know, it, but but it, so I'm, I'm just I'm I'm not the right guy to ask that question. To I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of. Uh, Do I, we have any fans of uh, community benefit? I, I have a feeling that in Westchester you're using the term in a different phrase in a different sense than what we mean here. So. In Westchester, we are not using it yet. Uh, Yonkers and uh, your shell. Uh, for Chester started looking into that and I think following this the example of the West Coast. But I understand that New York City did in 10 years ago a large study on it, so I thought that it had been applied uh, here. Well, if I could read the, you know, the intent of it just from the words, I'm not that familiar with its, um, with, the, with the details of it. Uh, the concept starts to get towards what we would like to see, and that is the way in which zoning uh, is utilized in one dimension of an improvement of the community. And uh, by the community benefit agreement, you're talking about uh, desired social outcomes and desired economic outcomes uh, with respect to physical development. And anything that can bring those, those, different, those three different dimensions together, I think, is a good thing. Uh, the problem at the moment is going to be uh, educating the community to know or, or to understand the benefits and the trade-offs and the whole process and, and being able to really participate in determining what is their benefit is the first thing. And the second thing is going to be the enforcement of it, because as Raquel mentioned, even with a lot of the requirements for public space in New York City, those requirements are not enforced. Uh, and you know, this was the problem we had with the financial services sector. Definitely a lot of rules that would prevent the crisis of 2007, 2008 were, were there. The rules were there, the legislation was there, but under the Bush regime, the office that, o that oversaw that and implemented those rules was diminished in budget by 75%. So if you don't have oversight, if you don't have enforcement, the zoning or the rules or the agreement mean nothing. So that's my interest in it. Yes, sorry. Uh, uh, my name is Mark Marshall. I'm an alumnus of the Earth Planning Program here at Columbia. Professor Clark was one of my youth advisors for the last great deal of admiration I'm currently the Director of Planning, Zoning, and Sustainability for the larger city of New Jersey. In that role, I manage the city's Planning Board, the Zoning Board, the Environmental Commission, the Rain Control Board, and the Landmarks Commission. And having said all that, <laughs> I'm also a former vice chair of the Planning Board in Manhattan. So, my comment is that um, planning and zoning should happen then in a vacuum. I speak specifically of zoning. And when we talk about zoning, we talk not only about bulk 
height of buildings, but also about uses. Um, and specifically, I won't say that when I say it shouldn't be done in a vacuum, when we do zoning, it should also take into consideration the, the infrastructure in the city, particularly water infrastructure, sewage infrastructure. These kinds of things, I don't think, were taken into consideration when Lower Manhattan was rezoned to allow residential use for former office buildings. And the result of that was we saw in 2012 with uh, Super Tom Sandy that the, that portion of Lower Manhattan became inhabitable. So under zoning is a tool that the city uses to control both bulk and use, but it's also a tool that was given to cities under municipal police powers to protect the health, welfare, and safety of its citizens. And I think it was somewhat criminal for the city to allow residential use in Lower Manhattan, knowing that there was a potential for flooding in Lower Manhattan, and still this zone change went through. Um, as far as the community benefits agreement is concerned, Columbia University negotiated a community benefits agreement with the Manhattan community, the Harlem community. Um, and when a group of local architects went to the university seeking work under this community benefits agreement, I was part of that group, uh, the, the, the university said, oh, no, the community benefits agreement doesn't apply to you, to professionals, it only applies to, to, uh, to construction jobs. <laughs> so we tried to fight that with, with the local politicians, but uh, we lost that fight. But it did get some publicity in the press and, DNA info, and so, um, but so the truth of the matter is, Professor Glass said there, are, there isn't a lot of teeth to the community benefit agreement, particularly for the benefit of all citizens and professionals. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we should wrap it up. One yes. more question. Yes, sir. question. Sure. This is just. Sure. <laughs> As a student of zoning, uh, past practitioner and current student, this is a fascinating discussion, both in its kind of its schema of the ends of zoning and how we how it seems to have progressed to become a tool of exclusion, as well as a tool of declining a city's economic productivity and potential by separating uses or, or neglecting to retain the public interest of a of a dynamic uh, of an economic center. So given those two trends that have been outlined in New York, the center of the brains of the world, the planners, right? Then how, what are types, do we need to shift in the understanding of the ends of zoning and its position within planning? Or do we, or, and, what types of changes in the means of zoning can you see? And two things come to mind. One is very practically, as a student of zoning, I know it's very hard to understand what's happening and what exceptions are occurring and who's Who's, who is making the decision? So is the answer simply to clone Mr. Bagley a thousandfold so that we can understand, so that the process becomes clear to the public, right? And thus, by understanding the implications of these zoning, will, will the city rise or will rules change? Or do you see an opening for stronger zoning with teeth that is associated with money. I think of, somebody asked my international example, I think about Colombia always, because there, if you, uh, if there's a new public, in Bogotá, Medellín, if there's a new public improvement, if you're the parcel next to it and you want to upzone or you want to build another story, you have to pay for it because you're considered to have um, received a benefit from, from the infrastructure that went near you. Or, um, in Mexico now, there's a discussion of, you know, we widen the sewer line, you can go up another five stories, you need to contribute to that. So there's a, um, so by zoning with teeth, I mean zoning that's connected very tangibly to the, the economic uh, investments in the bones of the city as well as the, the money that goes into new buildings. Well, I mean, that, at one Vanderbilt, that, that happened uh, to an extent. Um, I mean, there was a sham of a sham that went on before that, but um, they did put, or they are putting, oh, in excess of $200 million into Grand Central. Um, whether they couldn't have built anything other than a 1.6 million square foot building is a whole other discussion. Um, 
<coughs> with, with a very lucrative uh, observatory at the top. What? But does it matter whether it's you know, 900,000 or 1.6 or 1. Yeah, I think it does. In because, one, yeah. uh, well, yeah. so let's, let's just look the at the details. history yeah. for what happened there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, that whole process, they, they should fill everybody in. Okay. <laughs> uh, one Vanderbilt is, on, is a project on an entire block next to Grand Central Terminal on the north side of 42nd Street. The developer spent 10 years buying four buildings put, so that he could put them together. Uh, he finished buying them, I believe it was 2011. <coughs> and a couple months later, an article appeared in, in the Wall Street Journal and it said that they were going to build a 1.2 million square feet foot building. And um, it, it, as, a, as a journalist, you know, a suspicious type, uh, it seemed to me that the, the story was completely uh, informed by the developer. And I, I don't remember what the number of stories was, but um, uh, then, this, then the city announced that it was going to uh, upzone the area. And, and how did that even start? It started when the, the real estate broker for the developer had lunch at the Odeon, I even know where it was, uh, and said, uh, uh, with, with Amanda Burton, the planning chief and said, wouldn't it be a great idea if blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and Amanda said, well, let me think about that. So then the real estate broker had two subsequent meetings with city planning staff uh, and a zoning lawyer, uh, probably the best zoning lawyer in the city. He's now dead, so you don't have to worry about him. Uh, and, uh, Who was that? Norman Sandy. Uh, Sandy. Yeah. Uh, and, and they told him how they could do it. So anyway, long story short, all of a sudden, they say, the developer says, this, this, now, they were behind the story that says it's going to be 1.2. All of a sudden, they said, gosh darn it, we can't build on this site unless we can build 1.6 million square feet. Sounds like Sandy. Yeah. I'm stunned. Well, that, this is what I bring up. I bring up the issue that there is no one involved in this decision. I'm not defending the developer. This is the any, Mark Holiday of the Mark Holiday show. Any <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, um, the Mark's already given his Mark's already given his money, so um, <laughs> I just sort of. So it's not in jeopardy. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely. The chair not. and Columbia make the decision. Mark Holiday has nothing to do with it. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Mark does didn't even get to interview. Uh, no, but, you know, it's, well, two questions. One, you know, we, we can choose that project, and I'm pleased you chose that project, because I can say to whom does it matter whether there's an extra hundred, uh, sorry, extra ten floors or not? It probably doesn't matter to too many people, if you can deal with, that, you know, egress and so on. Right? It's not, an, it's not a place where shadow casting is a big issue for anyone or, you know, any landscaping or park or anything like that. So, you know, you've chosen one where the consequences aren't as dire as they are in other places. But you're reinforcing my, my issue, and that is that it happened with, without any oversight by the community, even if the community isn't affected that much. Well, the, the and this is, you five know, community boards did weigh in. Uh, uh, I, I think it was that they had participation that was just ignored. Well, but, this is but, the issue. Of participation but I, is but I do think they did have to pay. Oh, right? they, look, they and there's nothing wrong with that. But it sets in a chain of events. So right now, uh, the, the uh, MTA is selling three buildings right at three adjoining buildings right near there and uh, it's going to be for a tall building by Boston Properties and they put it on the agenda um, you know for the MTA board approval uh, was it this week or last week gosh darn they neglected to mention any of it to the city 
And so here, well, this, this horrifies me too. Absolutely, you've got you've got a process purely being hijacked by you know. Well, they pulled it from the agenda, so exactly. we'll see what happens in, in that. You know, the, with with all the uh, they work so well together, the mayor and the governor. That <laughs> maybe <laughs> some people. Well and that sounds like a discretionary action by the MTA that could be subject to secret. Well, that's right. Well, we'll see. Um, uh, and and they do the way the deal was struck. You know, well, if it's this big, it's you pay this much, and if it's that big, you pay that much. So, and there were two options, and I guess if they get neither one, then they can bail. But um, but one thing that is important, Charles, is that is that we it is a segue into getting the private sector to pay for the public infrastructure we need, right? Or yeah. We've done a great job of you know, redecorating the roof of Grand Central, but you know, it's pretty antiquated uh, in terms of uh, egress and access compared to, you know, for a major international city. So, you know, being a, I think it's, it's a great opportunity to say, all right, how do we, in, this is one instance where we've got 200 million towards uh, expanding and, and upgrading our major train station there. How do we use that? What structure do we put around that in, you know, for the next deal, such that 200 million towards the train station is what should have been done, right? Yes. And, and so on. So I think, uh, you know, we, we're starting to get there by this, you know, public need of private funds. We've now got the opportunity for, uh, you know, to, to create more structure about that, to create a smarter public that is able to define what funds are, and contributions it wants. Because the development certainly gets a benefit. Yeah. Right? So the, the key is, you know, what's the mechanism by which everyone is able to benefit by the improvement? So, all right, all right. Uh, uh, we're running out of gas here, but, but um, yeah, so Elliot, one minute, 60 one minute. seconds. I'm going to time you, right now, we have another 60 we seconds. Have, we have a, we have a, a a big public transportation system that's running massive deficits. We, we're, we're not keeping up with, with the rest of the world. The one thing that we, we have that we could do something is value capture. And uh, the problem that seems to come in is when, when they were talking about upzoning on the east side, every other oh, property owner was holding on to their property. Only the MTA was putting their property on the market. Um, when they did the Atlantic Yards, they practically gave it away to Forest City Ratner. That was probably the blue, blue, blue word. They did better at the Hudson Yard. But once again, the city, not the MTA, the city put up the 2.4 million to build that extension. And right now, it's, it's part of the, the tax base because the TIF, the tax increment financing, is, is, is only starting to kick in very slowly. And so one of the issues that, that we, we, we maybe we talked about something, I would like to continue this and begin to talk about how we begin to include some value capture because it is around um, certain key key um, nodes that, that a lot of this development is going to happen. And, and, and somehow zoning is here and the issues of finance are over here, yet yet the two of them ought to, ought to be joined more in the public interest as well. I'll stop there, but I can go on. I just wanted to say one, I'm really against zoning for sale and I'm against uh, side-by-side -side negotiations with the city. I think that is a disaster. I think if we want to do something in Grand Central, we have to have a plan for the public aspects of what we need prior to the developer coming with a plan. That's right. And I also think when it comes to air rights, I think we should limit air rights to 20% of their receiving side, in which case you won't be able to buy so much. So. That's just, I mean, I'm a very pro-development person and market, but I think we have to really guard our city. <coughs> okay, so these are some thoughts, some things to think about for the coming year that Elliot's going to have <coughs> on, on these very issues. Um, thank you all for coming.